In those days, the world was very different. There was no life, no biology, only physics and chemistry. Some people think that life began in what's been called the primeval soup, a weak broth of simple organic chemicals in the sea. Nobody knows how it happened, but somehow, without violating the laws of physics and chemistry, a molecule arose that just happened to have the property of self-copying. And after that, Darwinian evolution and life took off. Now that may seem a bit of a stroke of luck, but it only had to happen once. What's more, it may have happened on only one planet out of a billion billion planets in the universe. So the sort of lucky event we're talking about as happening on this Earth could be so rare that the chances of its happening in any one year somewhere in the universe were only one in a billion billion billion. That was enough luck for it to have happened. Of course, if it did happen on only one planet anywhere in the universe, that planet has to be our planet because here we are talking about it. But I think probably uh, the origin of life was a much more probable event than that, and therefore there probably is life on lots of planets around the universe. It's even been suggested that the origin of life may have been a rare event, but having started on one planet, it then spread to other planets in a process called panspermia by the Swedish chemist Arrhenius. And this is a fanciful reconstruction of panspermia by Carl Sims using the supercomputer, the connection machine. He doesn't really believe in panspermia, but it's a, it's a nicer animation anyway. Here is a spore arriving from another planet on some distant world. The spore swells and bursts, and its genetic material, its equivalent of DNA, is raining down on the planet. And now each one of these units is going to start sprouting a, what we shall call, plant, for want of a better word. These plants, by the way, Carl Sims didn't invent, he evolved them in his computer by a process very similar, though more elaborate, to the biomorph program that some of you may have seen in an earlier lecture. So on this planet, different kinds of plant are growing up, they're going through their growth cycle, and at the end of the growth cycle, they're going to reproduce again, and the whole cycle of growth and reproduction is going to be renewed. Here's a forest of plants, all waiting to reproduce. And here's the reproduction. They're going to be shot out into space, spores going off. There it goes. There they go. And the cycle is renewed. And the genetic information is sent off into distant space to recolonize other worlds. Well, that was, of course, pure fantasy. But it does make some serious points uh, about life anywhere in the universe. Uh, there will always be, I think, some kind of recurring life cycle which begins from information capsules of some sort going through a phase or phases of growth and elaboration and then finally returning again to the original uh, information capsule phase. Well, on our planet, the original self-replicating machines must have been a lot simpler than bacteria, but bacteria are the nearest idea we can get to what they might have been like. Here is a little view of bacteria reproducing. You can see how numerous they are. And each individual one of those bacteria is actually fairly complicated. Next picture, please. Um, there's a, the cell wall around it. It's got a chromosome of genetic material. It's not just a bag of fluid. It's got some complicated structure to it. And that is, the, on, on, on Earth today, the sort of minimal self-replicating machine as we now know them. At some stage in the early history of life, things like bacteria, we should probably call them bacteria, ganged up together, came together and formed what we now call the eukaryotic cell. Now, that's just a long word. It means the kind of cell that we're made of. Our cells are eukaryotic cells. So are plant cells, so are the cells of fungi and protozoa. It's now known, almost for certain, that the eukaryotic cell was formed by the ganging up of bacteria perhaps 2,000 million years ago. This model of a eukaryotic cell shows various bits like these mitochondria in orange, which are bacteria, or are at least linearly descended 
from ancient bacteria, and they go on reproducing all by themselves as though they were separate bacteria. Now, just as bacteria ganged up together to form a cell like that, so cells like that ganged up together to form larger units. And under this microscope here, uh, we have Volvox, which is a fairly simple kind of organism composed of gangs of cells, eukaryotic cells, formed into a hollow sphere. Would anybody like to come down and operate this microscope? Um, yes, in, in the front row there. What's your name? Katie. Katie. Have you ever used a microscope before, Katie? No. no. Okay. Well, in there are some Volvox, and they're great big green globular things. And this is how you move the stage about. Come here, and then you can see. If you move that one there, it moves that way. If you move this one here, it moves that way. And I think, oh, I seem to have found one for you. Try focusing there. There we are. Away, the, the other way, I think. There we are. That's got it. Now, are we seeing that right? Um, good. Well done, Katie. Thank you very much indeed. Um, What Katie's found is one Volvox. It's a globe of a few thousand, perhaps 1,000 cells. Uh, and each one of those cells is a little separate entity with little hairs that beat, called cilia, round the edge. And the whole globe moves as if it was one organism. Now, Volvox is not our ancestor. Volvox is a modern animal. But it's possible that something like that originally gave rise to our ancestors. We are, after all, colonies of cells. And this ganging up together of cells to form larger organisms has proceeded to truly colossal lengths. I said that an elephant was a huge digression on a copy me program, and I really did mean huge, because whereas a Volvox has a few hundred or thousand cells, an elephant is made of about a thousand trillion cells. So if an elephant is a robot carrying its own blueprint about, it's an almost unimaginably colossal robot. Of course, it's not particularly colossal in absolute terms, I mean, it's not big compared with a star, but it is colossal compared with the DNA molecules that built it. To understand this, imagine that we humans set ourselves the task of building a great Trojan horse to carry ourselves about in. Well, since we built it, the horse would look like a robot, uh, it would have... Uh, steel plates riveted together, and it would have television cameras for eyes. But how big would it be? Well, the answer is that if this horse was built by us to the same scale as we are built by our DNA, or a real horse is built by its DNA, then this horse would dwarf Mount Everest. So this is building on a truly colossal scale. A real living body, like a horse or like us, manages to be so big compared with the genes that built it because it grows by a very different process from the way a man-made machine would grow. A man-made machine is put together by people swarming all over it and riveting on plates of steel. But the special way of growing that living things have is very different. It's called exponential growth, or you could call it growing by local doubling. And here's how it works. You start with a single cell, and I'm going to represent that by a coin on this right-hand side of the chessboard. That's one cell. Now, that one cell divides and produces two just like itself. And because those two are just like itself, they also have the property of being able to divide and producing... Uh, four cells, and each of those can divide and produce eight. And you can see what we're doing. We're going on doubling up. And what we're going to try to do is to estimate how many, how high the pile of coins would be if we went on doubling up. This animal is growing and growing and growing. We've managed to fill one row of the chessboard. And now we would have to go on, and the next one would be that high, and the next one would be that high, and so on. We're growing this this animal doubling up, doubling up, doubling up. Now, how big would the pile of coins be if we got to the other end of the chessboard, to the 64th square? How tall would it be? 